Good morning, everybody. This is the um, fashion webinar. We're going to wait a few minutes so some people can join in. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have some wonderful speakers and expect to have a, a lively discussion. We'll give them just one more minute to sign in. How does it look, Sherry? I have someone who's already raised their hand. If you have any questions or comments, please put them into the chat. We'd love to know who's um, actually attending. So if you'd like to put your name in the chat and where you're uh, coming from, we would love to see that. Okay, I think why don't we start, Sherry, if you want to advance the slide. Today's webinar is Fashion Tourism in Indian Country. It's brought to you in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts. Fashion Tourism is an opportunity for artists, designers, and entrepreneurs to bring visitors to indigenous communities to experience, purchase, and learn about traditional and contemporary indigenous fashion. Next slide. My name is Gail Shehak. I'm IANTA's Community and Partner Relations Director. I'm from the Klamath Tribes in Southern Oregon and I've been a part of IANTA for 10 years. We have a great lineup of speakers for you. Our first speaker is Ramona Perez Herrera, also known as Mona. She is from the San Ildefonso Pueblo and has spent most of her life in education and has held various roles, including administration, event planning, coaching, and serving as an athletic director. She's committed to working diligently with SWAYA to provide excellent support to artists and ensure the success of the Santa Fe Indian market. She also has three beautiful children and an adorable, cute grandson. Next, we will have Twyla True and Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Reservation. Twyla has overcome a challenging upbringing to become a successful entrepreneur. She has experience in investing, incubating, owning, and operating multi-million dollar companies across various industries, including real estate, entertainment, education, retail, and consumer goods. Following Twyla will be Pashan Bread of the Comanche Nation. Pashan is a queer screenwriter, director, and producer, and I hope I get this right, Penatuku Sugar Eater, and Yapukura Root Eater bands of the Comanche tribe. Pashan has produced two fashion shows for the Teton Trade Cloth, and their work for focuses on indigenous women 
sexuality, and telling truth through humorous experiences. And our final speaker is Lauren Aragon from Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. Lauren is a Native American fashion designer and multimedia artist. He grew up on the Acoma Reservation, surrounded by family, art, and traditions. His work is influenced by the pottery created by his grandmothers, garments made by his aunt, and jewelry crafted from his uncle. Next slide. For those of you that aren't familiar with IANTA, for over 25 years, the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association has served as the only national organization dedicated to advancing cultural heritage tourism in Native nations and communities across the United States. IANTA is a national nonprofit governed by an all-Native all board of directors and serves as a united voice for the $15.7 billion Native hospitality sector. IANTA's mission is to define, introduce, grow, and sustain American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian tourism that honors tradition and values. We help businesses become market and export ready for domestic and international markets. Tribes who want to start or expand their cultural tourism can find resources at our website, ianta.org, and visitors interested in learning more about Native culture can visit nativeamerica.travel. Before we get started, if you have any questions, please place your questions in the Q&A and we will address them at the end of the webinar. My co-host Sherry Bowman from the Pueblo Laguna will um, be, will take over this part of the webinar. So Sherry, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Gail. So yes, please, um, if any of you have any questions, please play, play, place them in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of uh, the presentation. Um, like Gail said, I am Sherry Bowman. I'm from the Pueblo of Laguna. I serve as the education support specialist for IANTA and I have been in, involved with IANTA since its inception and have started my 16th year with the organization in January. I assist with all the education educational programming for um, IANTA. So let's welcome our first presenter, Mona Perea from Swaya, which is the Santa Fe Indian market. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, welcome. Thank you, IANTA, for this um, opportunity to be part of this uh, huge movement, what you guys are doing and bringing forefront um, to our communities, other nonprofits, and everybody just uh, what the main goal, you know, create opportunity um, for all of our Native artists. Um, so I like guess on um, my slides, I guess I can just kind of speak as as, um, as we switch slides. So the first one here, of course, is the opening of one of our, our fashion shows that we have every year that goes along with Indian Market. So I'm going to change. Are we using a keyword? I'm sorry. Yeah, can you just say next slide? I'm okay. sorry, I should have said that. Okay, so Santa Fe Indian Market is a community event. Um, uh, I was a market baby. I have no talent, no artistic talent at all. But um, I used to get up in the morning. We leave Sanai by four. We'd get here and we'd unload in the dark and we'd have flashlights and uh, uh, setting up our uh, my uncle's booths and uh, me and my sister would be given five dollars and we would be told make it last all day. So um, we knew, you know, we knew it from the artist point, um, never knew what goes behind. But in these slides, you'll see it is a community event. People from all over come, it's it's family oriented. 
um, everybody gets together for these different events. You meet everybody um, on from both ends of the spectrum. Next slide. So when people say, okay, fashion, um, you know, there's a lot of artists who are still um, getting warm with the feeling that fashion and art do go together. Just like uh, Lauren stated, you know, his wonderful uh, work comes from three different classifications, if you would. Um, so Swaya works with, uh, we have 10 um, classifications, which include pottery, 2D, jewelry, sculpture, um, diverse arts, beadwork, quill work, basketry, Pueblo wooden carvings, and we also have our youth category. So I see, you know, um, now that I'm seeing in the different fashion that's coming in, a lot of it's based on those. Um, we have dresses that have real life pottery shards. We've seen um, the designs placed on different garments, beadwork, quill work. Um, we have a new, um, it's beautiful. I wish I could share it, might have it. We have a lady who incorporated a basket as a corset as part of her textile. I've never seen that until this year. So that really like, that awed me. Um, but again, these are just samples, some samples of that, that go into the fashion um, scene. Next slide. So for last year's market, we had a total of 980 artists, 158 tribes rep, uh, present, represented, total booths 728, and average visitors 100,000. Estimated economic impact in 2018 was 165.3 million. So we usually don't get those, you know, those reports till like a year, like two years later. Or so um, because they average everything, they pull money from hotels and all that. So, you know, that connection that I'm really focused on is, um, you know, fashion bringing into to tourism. It brings money into not just the city or where it's held, that money gets used into programs. Uh, like, you know, we did, um, we had some loan, uh, we worked with banks where they would match our uh, percentage and we get loans to some of these artists who, may have been affected by COVID. Um, prices went up, um, supplies were not available, et cetera. So different things like that come into play for um, all artists across the board. Next slide. Mission, to bring native arts to the world by inspiring artistic excellence, fostering education, and creating meaningful partnerships. You, you know, and um, based again on the numbers, we we feel that we need to commun um, communicate the efforts that are being made. Um, fashion and pottery go hand in hand in many ways. In the reservations that I visit during community outreach, a lot of the girls would see um, a ribbon dress for the first time and they would just be so curious. They had questions. Um, who makes them, I want to learn to make them, and just seeing things like that really boosts their inner fire to get into the arts even more, which brings their talent to the table, and hopefully they can, um, you know, they can have their sustainable livelihood based on their talents and stuff that comes from the family, comes from their, their homes and whatnot. Next slide, please. Swaya Native Fashion is dedicated to the highlighting of the breadth of indigenous fashion designers and their representation, promoting and honoring the vibral, vibrant cultural expression of Native North American communities through the artistry of fashion. Again, I was one that, I was just like a lot of my, my artists. Why do we focus on fashion so much? Why is there so much about fashion? Why isn't there more highlight on artists themselves for other classifications? Well, to answer that, I think that after, you know, my second market, I got it. You know, at first I was kind of like leaning more towards what they were saying. And, but now that I see what fashion actually does from 
both ends of the spectrum is just is phenomenal. Um, it creates passion. It creates representation from different tribes. You know, it's not just the Southwestern. You know, we have like Pishan. We have her her tribes. There's many other tribes more east. There's so many that I don't even want to mispronounce them. But of, of the 158 tribes, I've probably read each and every one um, upon doing our booth counts, our booth checks, and our booth cards. So it's so wide that us here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the surrounding tribes and pueblos, we're just barely learning. We're just touching the the getting our feet wet in the fashion. And I think this is this movement is really, really important and necessary for all artists across the board to hear this, to to understand where our initiative comes from and what we all want to accomplish together. Next slide. 10 years of Swayo Native fashion. So if you look at 2014, you know, our fashion shows were outdoors. Um, Cathedral Park. I was told they were at um, somewhere at DeVargas. So these, you know, the fashion show has definitely evolved. 2018, we have, you know, the runway and the convention center. Wasn't totally where we're at today. If you look at 2023, we have a high, uh, a lighted uh, runway. Uh, just, it, you know, that place turns into a, a wonderland. It's, it's, it's really nice to witness and see what a small team can do and the money generated from these fashion shows allows it to happen again and it allows it to again create and um, I want to say I will create and feed that platform of fashion is is what's what's in our laps today and it's that and tourism just goes hand in hand next slide just a couple of our beautiful models we're very fortunate that these beautiful souls have came and and were able to be part of our fashion show. You can see Pishan there in the the middle bottom. Jessica Brave, Mr. Braveheart, Miss Pantu, to name a few. Next slide. So we have some collaborations that too also creates um, partnerships, like we're saying. This year we have um, Indian Motorcycle. They will be um, supplying a bike that we're gonna have, we're gonna be auctioning off. It's going to be painted um, by a couple of artists and it will be auctioned in August. I believe August, late July, August is are the dates that was given to me. Um, other names, Kent Monkman, Boys and Girls Club, The Ballman, Tabu from um, Black Eyed Peas and many more. We're very blessed to, to have these collaborations and uh, support from um, different people that also share our vision. Next slide. How does native fashion support tourism? So indigenous insight, this form of fashion rooted in indigenous traditions and aesthetics provides insight into native heritage and history, learning opportunity. Native fashion allows visitors to learn about and appreciate indigenous culture, promoting culture exchanges and understanding. Interest and curiosity. It often sparks interest and curiosity about the native way of life, traditions and worldview. Economic support. Purchasing native fashion pieces directly supports local indigenous designers and artisans, which in turn supports the local economy preserving tradition. It also ensures the preservation and continuation of traditional crafting techniques and knowledge. I wish we could um, deliberate on that right now. Um, I, you know, that would be good to take some, some questions and stuff. But um, at this point, again, you know, the curiosity, that's, that's what I want to touch base on. The curiosity of uh, not just non-Indians, but a lot of them that we get phone calls. We saw your fashion show. Um, how can I get uh, the garment that so-and-so was wearing? How can I purchase this? Um, I'm part of a uh, group and we want to purchase this, this and that for our um, short film. 
So all of that is is just a way of of um, again creating that opportunity. It makes us happy that we're able to make those connections and uh, forward them to the artists and get um, all of, all the good that comes with it is there uh, in their lap. So it's just up to our artists to take advantage of that. Next slide. See you in August. Yes, definitely our Indian market is going to be on August 17th and 18th. So I hope to see you guys all there. Next slide. So I um some of these slides are just kind of uh giving you a a, a little um more insight on our on our usual models. Pishan, I'm this is just a little of what she does, but this is what we we like to to brag. Next slide. I believe this is where Pishan comes in. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I don't so want to. Okay. Well, in closing, um, thank you for you know for my presentation, and um, I hope that it kind of gave a little insight of what our goal here is at Swaya and what I strive to do in my position is just create that opportunity. Um, but thank you for allowing me to present. I appreciate it. Good well, thank you too, Mona. We apologize, but uh, Twyla True will be unable to join us today. So we're going to move on to our next presenter, Pishan Brad from the Comanche, Kiowa and Cherokee Nations. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Pishan. Good morning and thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk a little more about myself as an artist, a designer, and most importantly, to talk about data fashion and my passion for it and how it all correlates within tourism, because I believe it's such a huge, crucial part of tourism and how we express ourselves and how we want to bring fashion into our Native communities, but also how we, as Native people, amplify and grow and find ourselves within a bigger industry. So tourism is a big part of that, but we'll get to that soon. So my name is Fishon Brad. Um, I'm Comanche, Kiowa, and Cherokee. I'm a model, a filmmaker. I do a lot of work within fashion. I was a creative director for Teton Trade Cloth for two years. I also coordinate fashion shows in the meantime, and I work with Ralph Lauren. And one of our pro projects that I worked with Ralph Lauren for is the Naomi Glasses um, campaign with Ralph Lauren and we just did our two drops and they came out amazing and beautiful so here's a little more about me next slide all right so this is oh okay <laughs> and so as a model here's a little more about my work and kind of where I began modeling I started modeling it in the middle or the first picture to the left is my first ever fashion show, I had modeled for Orlando Dugay. I was 13 years old and having such exposure to fashion and getting into fashion shows was a really big deal at the time because at the time no one was doing that. And it was Swaya. I remember the first ever fashion show I had walked in for Swaya, which is this photo in the middle. Um, that was in, that was at the IAIA museum in their courtyard. I remember that being called Fashion Heat. And from Fashion Heat, it kind of grew and became this larger fashion show, which has brought in a lot of uh, audiences and people and designers and creatives alike. And as we go down, I've modeled for Eighth Generation, I've modeled for Ralph Lauren, Orlando Dugay, I've modeled for Levi's. And this, all this wouldn't have happened unless I had access to native fashion. Native fashion really helped me build my portfolio as a model. And having that portfolio then eventually found an agent for me, as well as um, as well as just having an agent and a portfolio and being able to book these bigger jobs, which was absolutely incredible. And I'm so thankful for Native fashion for giving me this part of my career and life. And the only thing I can do as a model and as someone who loves fashion is reciprocate that and constantly be an example and push native uh, artists forward in everything that I do, whether it's my filmmaking or my work with Ralph Lauren, my advocacy for native art. But this is a little more about my modeling journey. Next slide. Uh, 
So here's a little more about my creativity and work within the film industry. So I have been in the film industry since I was maybe 16. I worked on my first feature film um, one summer in high school and just fell in love with it and then continued to work in film. Um, one of my biggest projects to date has been working with Marvel Studios on Echo. And even with that, with such a na native heady production, we really relied on native fashion and art through that production and bringing in artists and bringing in people to see art on film and to know where that came from. Um, also in Outer Range as well, we really loved having native fashion and art within the production and making sure that's accurate to native culture as possible. And throughout all this work and throughout my work as a filmmaker, unfortunately there was a strike. There was a writer strike and I have always been into fashion. I have always been into designing. I had come up with my brand name and I said, okay, well, someday I will do this. Um, I will do this dream. I will go into fashion someday when I can find the time to. Sure enough, I found the time during our writer's strike last summer. It lasted from June until December. So I was out of my film work for a solid six months. And throughout that time, I decided to, to uh, find my own brand, which is Sutai or House of Sutai in September 2023. And um, doing that, I was really surprised by the support I had as a designer in the Native community. And I think it's because throughout all of my work, I've uplifted and championed Native designers and artists and have always tried to find ways to create opportunities. Um, so I think that that's where that support came from. But and most importantly, why I'm so passionate about tourism within fashion, within Native fashion and how the two connect is because I've curated fashion shows in Oklahoma as well as New Mexico. And one of the things about doing work in Oklahoma that I love because it's my home state and I'm from there, what I loved is bringing opportunities to young native models as well as designers who were dreaming and wanting an opportunity to showcase their work. And I had throughout this process of organizing a fashion show, I had done an open call online asking for people to submit their information in and for people to come in and to see the amount of response of people who wanted to be in fashion and wanted that opportunity to be up there and have a place to showcase was impeccable. It was incredible how many came together and wanted this opportunity and um, definitely keeps me hopeful and aware that there are people out there who want to pursue fashion and just need the opportunity. And also the fact that so many people came from all over the country to a fashion show. We had models travel from like North Dakota or South Dakota, all the way, or even we had a designer, a Haudenosaunee designer from New York come all the way down from, uh, to come down to Oklahoma, which I thought was astounding and amazing. But um, this is more of my professional work and what I do and within my fashion, what I have found within having a brand, I absolutely love showcasing my heritage and also showcasing my influences from Oklahoma to my great aunt Josephine's weaving designs, which is on the caftan in the middle with the lovely model, Jula Harjo. She is wearing a weaving design that my great aunt Josephine Lapp had made back in her day when she was a professor at IAIA. So I love showcasing my family history and showing designs and, um, representing that. So this was my first ever runway debut. I had debuted for Swaya Fashion Week and that gave me a platform more than I could ever ask for. I've had people reach out to me to style them for celebrity events or people wanting to purchase, people wanting to invest. And having that opportunity and that platform really helped me grow as a brand and gave me support in ways that I didn't even know. And also launched, um, gave me press materials, photos, everything of the sort to build my brand. And I just launched a website actually, which I'm very excited for. So again, this is more of my work and kind of where I find the passion with fashion and with tourism. So next slide. All right. 
let's get down to brass tacks. <laughs> so tourism and native fashion go hand in hand, obviously, for many different reasons. I have been in different fashion shows around the country with and um, out of country as well. But most importantly, the native fashion shows bring a different type of community that I absolutely love and am passionate about. The photos you see of the woman in the red dress over here with the lace, that's from the fashion show I had coordinated in Oklahoma. And the audience was packed. And what I loved about it is that a lot of native people were wanting to uplift each other and looking for ways to continue to push each other forward, whether it was designers, models, makeup artists, everyone. So this is an industry that brings so much creativity and it starts from on the runway to off the runway to behind the screen. And um, what I love about it is that it provides avenues of representation to be sought by the fashion industry. So we have a lot of people coming in to the runway shows and obviously we see a lot of native talent coming up rather, so it gives brands and it uplifts native artists for other brands to see that they can truly have native made rather than native inspired garments and designs. And that's one of the best things we can do is give our native artists more of a platform and be seen. And, and, and myself as an artist, I wanna be seen and I wanna be approached to do collaborations with brands and to work with um, different brands and also have a portfolio and resume that matches up to be potentially working in a fashion house someday. That's one of my dreams. But most importantly, it creates exposure and uplifts designers to new platforms. And even better, it gives opportunities to young native models and um, creatives, whether it's styling, whether it's modeling, whether it's doing hair or makeup or doing photography, doing fashion photography, it opens up so many avenues for young native creatives. And that's what I love. I love meeting new um, creative natives that want to be a part of this industry because this industry is very, tough it's very it's very it takes a lot of strength and a lot of grit but what i love about the native like being in the native side of the industry is that it's so loving and it offers a lot of space for people to grow and it's a collective of people wanting to help each other but what i think the most important thing about tourism is the fact that it doesn't just draw in native audiences, it draws in non-native audiences and lets people have a look into our world and into our designs and what we are accomplishing as designers and what we think would be incredible for everybody to see. Thank you, Pishan, that was Thanks. wonderful. Oh my gosh, how exciting to have such a creative job. <laughs> Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's definitely crazy. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So the, our next presenter, uh, we have Lauren Aragon and I will let him uh, take it from here. Awesome, thank you. Um, you go on to the next slide. What's it hope to a shinda mehaka kerste kutan of the ako mehsta. That was my uh, traditional salutation in Karis, which gives a uh, hello greeting, followed by the introduction of myself and my given name, clan, and tribal identity. And that roughly translates to hello, everyone. I am Evergreen. I am Antelope Clan from the Acoma Pueblo. And welcome to my presentation on fashion, tourism, and Indian country. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed a slide. No worries. That's cool. <laughs> So a little bit about me. Uh, once again, my given name is is pronounced Hakak, which means evergreen. I am from the Antelope Clan uh, from the Acomo Pueblo. I consider myself a multimedia artist and fashion designer, but prior to that, next slide. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> next slide. Yes. Um, I pretty much had uh, quite the journey through uh, different disciplines in, in education. Um, so just a little bit about uh, my journey uh, into getting into fashion starts from home, where I like to say I was brought up with a good 
a good mix of both traditional and modern upbringing. My grandfather, being the traditionalist of the family, always keeping us in tune with our our Akama ways, our traditions, our dances, our songs, stories, uh, the things that we believe in. He was always <clears throat> repeating that to us every day, uh, especially around around supper time. It was, it was always great to have that connection back to my culture through him. So we had a very good relationship uh, growing up, and he and I would always <clears throat> converse in our in our language and um, share share things between us. Uh, he had a a, a garage that he ran. So that's kind of where my background in, in science and uh, engineering comes from. So, and he was very adamant about getting a, an education, getting a proper education, something promising that would give a career. So he was really the one that pushed me into doing those things. But again, we, we shared a lot of things. We did, uh, we, we were heavy into Star Wars and a lot of geeky stuff like that. So it was, it was great to have him around and uh, I, I miss him a lot. But then there's my mother, who is an educator, was an educator, retired now, and now a full-time grandmother. So she was really my first art teacher growing up, taught me how to use the pencils, pens, crayons, watercolor, uh, just about anything to, to draw uh, things with, imagine things up and getting them on paper or, or whatever I could get them onto. She also had some hand in uh, pottery, which I would sit around and watch her do. Um, <clears throat> so these two figures in my in my family were very uh, involved with me and, and got me moving forward in, in my life and um, the the thing my mother always introduced was more modernism she was very much more into the the future of things especially with educating she would learn new things and pass them on to me learning about uh, science and technology so that sort of thing um, <clears throat> and it was it was mostly education for me I, I was a bookworm I was I was a nerd I grew up and did a lot of uh, grew up for the first 18 years of my life in Acoma Pueblo and uh, went on to to school uh, on the reservation and then high school in a nearby town town of Grants New Mexico where I finished uh, and moved on uh, to college but um, in that mix I was illustrating a lot I did a lot of drawing and soon found a way to um, make a little bit of money on the side. I became an entrepreneur, unbeknownst to myself. Uh, I was uh, doing greeting cards as a kid. My, my family traveled to a lot of art markets and arts and craft shows uh, throughout the Southwest. And um, I had my own little business of making greeting cards. And this, these pictures here are examples of that done in ink and colored pencil, uh, mostly around holidays. So that, that's what these are. And again, uh, putting my cultural twist to a lot of those things. Um, to represent who I am, where I come from. So next slide. <clears throat> um, in, in my career in education, I became a mechanical engineer. <laughs> I have my degree in uh, bachelor, a bachelor of science in um, mechanical engineering from Arizona State University. And did that for about 13 plus years. I transitioned or I interned uh, for a couple of years while in college for the 3M company in Minnesota. And that kind of really put me in tune with what I really wanted to do, the things that I really like as being a mechanical engineer. And um, a couple of those things were testing and design. So um, outside of once finishing college in 2004, um, I went on to become a test engineer for a company in, in Phoenix and um, did a lot of automotive testing. We instrumented vehicles to test brakes, uh, collected data with uh, instrumentation and uh, fed all that back to the customer about the performance of vehicles. Um, after that, I became an instrumentation engineer, uh, a lead instrumentation engineer, where we did a lot of calibration, took care of our own equipment and instrumentation, that, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, that was about five years of that I did. And I moved on to becoming a mechanical design engineer. And this is where I think I really started discovering my passion for designing and, um, albeit a lot of restrictions and specifications you have to abide to by the customer as being a mechanical engineer. Um, I was able to, uh, express my creativity through military designing military seats for ground vehicles for our, our 
our servicemen and women and um, moved on from that to virtual training uh, where I was re-instrumentate, redesigning uh, weaponry uh, for use in a training simulation for law enforcement and military. Um, did a lot of that. And so it's like a big, that, that's probably the career I love the most as an engineer because it let me really be creative with, with what I could do. And um, on top of that, it was playing with giant computers and <laughs> giant uh, video games, uh, true to life video games. So um, again, I did that all in about a little over 13 years, all in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, in the mix, it, part of that, halfway through that, next slide. <clears throat> I uh, made my return to art. I, I really missed drawing. I really missed the creativity that came without any limitations uh, in art. I started to feel like I was um, getting trapped uh, in engineering, especially with all the restrictions and uh, um, specifications that customers were re requesting. And art became my outlet. Art became where I could really just let my, my mind go and do the things that I wanted to and, and uh, express and, and showcase the things that I wanted to see. And in, in that return, I made my first trip to the Santa Fe Indian Market in uh, 2009. And from that, I was very inspired for, from fellow natives who were doing art, which incorporated art and technology. And I told myself, I want to be a part of that. I, I want to showcase what I can do. I have this engineering background that I can definitely put to use in creative ways and uh, d create my own creative freedom. And um, express the designs that uh, that were meaningful to me and, and share my creativity with everyone. So um, baby steps, I started kind of revamping my illustration skills uh, and tuning that into more of a fine art rather than just a hobby. Um, got more, in, more into inks and uh, more technical uh, illustration instruments. <laughs> to do more precise kind of work. Uh, I wanted to get back into pottery, but that was really, uh, it's, it's a lot of, it, it's a big task. It's a big task to do our traditional pottery. It's, it's a lot of, um, there's a lot of effort that goes into it to collect your clays, your slips, uh, all the materials you need to start designing. So um, being an engineer, still full-time working and doing this on the side, I found it difficult, but I did find gourds, which were abundant in Arizona. So I started down the path of becoming a gourd artist and did a lot of sculptural things with that. And there's an example right there in the purple and turquoise uh, design that I did there. And, um, and then jewelry. I had an uncle that uh, just recently passed, um, sad to say, but <clears throat> he was the one that taught me how to do jewelry. I saw him as a young kid making these beautiful pieces every time uh, I would visit him and he would just kind of tell me about the process and I never really got my hands on it until uh, just later on in life as an adult and he taught me uh, just all the things that he knew about silversmithing and then helped me kind of find my own style and design work. Um, one of my earliest pieces in the necklace on top there um, as a result of, of that learning <laughs> and um <clears throat> being an engineer i had my hand on the in, you know i was always at the computer so graphic design kind of came very easily it's a second nature so uh designing through three dimensional programs applied what i learned from that to create uh digital graphic art and you'll see kind of the upgrades to my my card making there and then a little poster that i made as part of a exhibition that was held in phoenix um as i started getting back into the arts next slide <clears throat> so my grandfather being who he was always expressed uh, the the thoughts of hanging on to tradition uh hanging on to culture and that also meant hanging on to family traditions and my mother and aunt were seamstresses for as long as i could remember i really had no passion to sew <laughs> until i uh, started my illustrations again and people started saying well, that'd be kind of cool to see on on something that I could wear, a t-shirt, a shirt, a dress, something. So started playing in my head about how I could, you know, get that started. And 
one of the other things was that I see my mother and aunt do was get these fabrics that just didn't have no identity to them uh, as far as like true native identity. And I, it would put it in my head to start coming out with designs that were really truly Acoma Pueblo that I could use in, in making my own garments. So with the help of my mother and aunt, they taught me how to sew, doing my first stitches um, and some support from friends. I was able to start creating my own designs. So next slide. And I wanted my designs to have more meaning. And again, one of the things that was expressed to me a lot was the preservation of culture and traditions. But also what I really wanted to do was inspire future generations. I wanted them to think outside of the box, outside of the clay pots, so to speak. We, we were a lot of designers, a lot of artists that do really amazing work in pottery, but I felt like we could do a lot more outside of that and express that through different uh, genres and art. So what I like to say is my designs are culturally fueled designs, meaning that they are all coming from Acoma Pueblo and expressed through wearable art. And Acoma Pueblo is, is, is really the foundation of my inspiration, where I come from, Og, Og or Hog, or, uh, our traditional pottery art, which is a large part of that, our stories and beliefs that I heard and learned growing up and our matrilineal society, which is what we're based on and, and really inspired um, a lot of what I do even today. Next slide. <clears throat> so to start out with fashion, I threw my first designs down on t-shirts. I had a friend of mine who was starting out his uh, printing business and we collaborated in Arizona and he was able to bring a lot of my design visions to life. So this is pretty much where it all began it was just on, on t-shirts, just an expression of my designs. And a lot of people caught onto it, really loved how it was. It had a, a, a pretty good vibe going and I really wanted that to continue. So again, started in this, pro in this time frame, started learning more about textile printing and started designing my own prints uh, to produce on larger scale of uh, fabric. So next slide. <clears throat> So with that, I formulated Aquanav. It was a company I co-founded. Oh, back one. And um, this is where I, I really felt I let my creativity fly. I felt no restrictions. I had no limitations. I could do whatever I wanted with whatever kind of materials I wanted to do it with. So a lot of designs um, going from left to right, you see our, our prints, uh, designs that are that are all inspired by pottery art. Uh, even our traditional garment wear, the, the, the black with the red sash is kind of representative of what the women wear during the ceremony, but in a more contemporary style for other people to, to share in that idea of, of the empowerment that we're known for in our community, um, our, especially our, our, our female community. So um, stories, uh, sunsets, just things in nature that, that just, inspired me I, I wanted to express through wearable art it's all here and the last piece was a, a design that i did for walt disney world uh, back in 2018 um idea was to create a, a centerpiece dress for an exhibition happening at the epcot center and uh, the way they wanted me to do this was to be inspired by the pottery that i chose from the museum museum of indian arts and culture and then translate that into a modern uh, design <clears throat> and that's that's what they got and what is still on display down in Epcot Center. Next slide. Next slide please. And then Progressing on with, with that and being continuously inspired, I, I, I started thinking about what, uh, back one slide, please. Huh. Um, started thinking about more about how I could reach further with, with my fashions. And the one thing that was always sitting in the back of my mind was how, do, how can I 
get this to be something that I can wear. <laughs> and a lot of guys that would buy for their ladies from me with those dresses and women's wear, uh, were always expressing that too. Uh, what, what, what do you have for me? What do you have for the guys? And really kind of played with that idea for a long time. And then the pandemic happened and everything kind of shut down and kind of um, put, put me in the dark for a while. And I had to rethink a lot of things. And uh, one of those in that time frame started thinking more about menswear and, and, and more accessories, uh, which expressed still the, the pottery art and the stories behind that inspired the, the designs under Akronav. And um, it, with, with everything closed and everything really kind of gave me, you know, a, a moments of clarity to figure out how I wanted to do this. And uh, just late last year, finally got everything together and launched this new brand, Towering Stone, which I produced on the uh, Santa Fe uh, or the uh, South, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> the Native American uh, Fashion Week back in May. So a really great opportunity to uh, showcase my newest designs, um, all handmade designs here in my studio and um, just the crazy to see how much I can advance this. I mean, I'm, I'm still going crazy in my mind on what next I want to launch, what more I want to showcase. And uh, just continuing to tie every, all this back to culture. So next slide, please. So tying this back to tourism, um, kind of show of hands if we can get, get you to say uh, answer off on these in the comments uh, just to see how many of you uh, have heard of the Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. <laughs> A couple of people are raising their hands on screen. And you can add your comments time. in the chat. Yeah, please put your comments in the chat. And just let us know. It's always interesting to see because I always get, you know, people telling me, oh, I, I love your Pueblo. It's so beautiful. Or I love the pottery art you guys are known for. So how many of you are aware of our pottery art culture? You'll see it all throughout the Southwest. They're, they're world renowned. I mean, they were made famous by a lot of different artists and still continue to make them famous. And so if you've heard of our pottery art, let us know. And some people don't know and others do, but we actually have a tourism business uh, in Aqua. Acoma Pueblo. So how many of you have visited our Pueblo? I've actually been there on, on top of the Mesa. There's a tour that happens and that we just recently opened back up with all this. Uh, we were kind of shut down since pandemic too. So it's great to see that back in action. So, so you can continue to comment on that. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> So yeah, so kind of bringing this all back to tourism. Um, what is the connection to tourism? Again, I've, I've always, I'm always told wherever I go or by several people that stop by and recognize the designs. You know, I've, I've been to Acoma, it's such a beautiful place. It's, it's so magical, it's so mystical. It's, you know, it's everything, it's, it's so mysterious. Um, it's always great to hear that. And I love that that opens up conversation to talking to them about Acoma a little bit more or to educate others who, who are in, in my booth or wherever I'm at about who we are. And um, we're, we're located here in New Mexico, land of enchantment. Um, we're known as the Sky City, obvious, for obvious reasons that we're high up on the Mesa. Um, the whole city, basically town was built, a village is built on top of a sandstone Mesa. Uh, we're considered one of the oldest continually inhabited civilizations in New Mexico or in North America. And um, as I mentioned, we have our cultural center, the Sky City Cultural Center, which is based at the, the bottom of the Mesa, and which is a museum and just a place to uh, showcase a lot of our cultural dances, practices, um, demonstrations of such. There's a gallery in there uh, that, show, that changes, uh, I think, about every year with different uh, exhibitions. So if you ever get a chance, come out to Acoma and, and see see who we are, uh, what we offer as far as tourism is. And um, the place, Acoma is, is known as Ogle or Hoggle, 
and the word <clears throat> itself is uh, a place prepared or to prepare. Um, and then that carries some meaning into what I do. Um, and then just kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a language nerd and I kind of look back at our language from time to time speaking with my family. Uh, Akwa man means uh, Akama, like I'm Akama. Akwa man, that's what I mean when I say that is I am Akama, <clears throat> which is, was kind of a conversation just recently we had and it was like, maybe that's why they, the Spaniards called it Akama. They made, they translated Akwa man into Akama. <laughs> I don't know. We, we, it's it's part of the mystery. So I love that things like that can provoke conversation and um, that that future generations have a, an interest in in who we are. So next slide. <clears throat> so with fashion, I, I like to say that I'm bringing my culture to the runway. I'm bringing my culture on tour to other people. Uh, I was very Grateful to be part of uh, Phoenix Fashion Week, which is where I learned a lot of my fashion background. Um, it's basically six years of education, of college education, put into three months of <laughs> um, boot camp, uh, which is literally what it's called, the Phoenix Fashion Week boot camp, and teaches all the ways of, of uh, running a fashion business. So I've been very fortunate to be part of that. I was named uh, Couture Designer of the Year in 2018. Uh, with the designs, um, where the two the two ladies are holding the pottery in a dance that opened up for my show. Uh, the bottom was a collection that I showcased, and again, it's it's um, with this opportunity, I'm able to create an awareness to who we are, where we come from, also creating an awareness to our uh, diversity in native fashion in in native country. Um, we're not all the same, you know. There's the Plains Indians, there's the Pueblos, the Navajo we're all different. We all have different uh, identifiers to who we are. So it was great to be able to showcase this and educate people along the way about who I am, where I come from, and, and our differences among the cultures. So definitely a, a thing about education, um, educating about our cultural identities, our tribal uniqueness, and um, now moving that into menswear, men's fashion, so that that audience can grow too. Next slide. And before I close, I just want to say, um, Pishan hit on a great point about how uh, film is starting to influence fashion design. And, and I'm grateful to the opportunities that we have now to be able to outfit more of our uh, native brothers and sisters in film, in the film industry. And also that takes its tour elsewhere. It, it allows us to express our designs on People who can showcase them and, and speak intelligently to them and um, give give us some some notice and awareness. So uh, I want to thank Pishan for bringing that up. Um, but um, I just uh, on, in closing as well, I, I want to say that I have a, a shop now in Santa Fe, which is and it's really great to be among a lot of the other native owned businesses in Santa Fe. So if you're ever in town, come stop by. We are uh, at the El Centro Mall. Um, it's it's brand new. I just opened up in in December and still a work in progress. So, uh, reach out and you know get get more information there. But uh, in closing, I hope you guys can share some of this information with others and um, get get more people aware to who we are in, in Indian country as far as fashion design goes. And uh, appreciate the opportunity with Anta and uh, look forward to seeing y'all in um, in New Orleans this year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. I apologize for the chat not being active. I don't know what went on there, but we do have um, some comments in the Q and A. Um, some people did comment that uh, they. I let me go back up here. Excuse me, Julia Thomas. She's oh yeah, the chat is enabled, um, but she said she loves Akuma Pueblo pottery. <laughs> And then uh, J Julie Thompson said she has visited the Pueblo and it's so beautiful. And Donna Lee Uno was gifted a piece of Akama pottery when she was awarded um, her PhD. So that's what we have in the Q&A and then in the chat. I'm sorry, again, I apologize. So um, we do not have any um, anything else in the Q&A other than that. 
So I would like to um, thank all of you again, the speakers and attendees for joining us today. I'd like to share with you that we do have another webinar coming up on July the 16th at 10 a.m. This webinar presents the latest updates on IANTA's partnership with the Bureau of Land Management and the combined efforts to support cultural tourism development around the California National Historic Trail in Nevada. Learn about the ongoing pollster contest, recreational opportunities along the trail, conservation and eco-cultural -tour tourism, native perspectives on the trail's history, representation at the California Trail Center, and Nevada support for tribal tourism. Join us to discover how we're reshaping the narrative of the Nevada people along this historic trail. And you may register for that webinar if you're interested on our website at iata.org backslash webinars. Again, thank you to all our presenters. If you'd like their information, um, I do have it written here. I also will be sending out the recording of this webinar with the PowerPoint for those of you that have registered. If you are not a member of IANTA and would like to become a member, please visit our website again at ianta.org backslash membership. We want to remind you that aside from webinars like this, we offer online resources, working to educate visitors and the greater tourism industry about visiting Native nations and communities. You can find all our web resources on our website and they are downloadable. And also I would like to join, invite you to join us at our 26th Annual American Indian Tourism Conference taking place in at the Paragon Casino Resort um, that will be hosted by the Tunuka Biloxi Tribe. Registration is now open on our website. The event is October 28th through the 31st. Sponsorships are still available as well as, as, well as exhibitor and artisan space. So if you're interested, please email me um, at sbowman, B-O-W-M-A-N, at ianta.org. We'd love to have you join us. Again, thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions about any of our programming, you may find that online at our website, ianta.org. Again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, especially all you speakers. You are all fabulous. And the audience, thanks for participating. Again, I apologize about the chat. So with that, I would like to thank you and you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.